This week we're going to delve deeper into the world of networks and we're going to be looking at how the different models of networking computers work together. So we'll probably be going into topologies a bit later on and we're going to look at hardware and software that is required. For today we're going to be focusing on what client server and peer-to-peer -peer models of network computers actually do, how does that all work. We're going to all move on to showing an understanding of thin clients and thick clients and the differences between them. That's going to be our key goal today. Okay, let's start with some key terms. Now there's a lot of key terms in this particular unit. So start off by just jotting these down. So pause the video and make sure that these are in your exercise book. Things like local area network, wide area network, personal area network, metropolitan area networks, these, these are basic things. You, you know, you're used to this from before. You know about wireless personal area networks. Just make sure that that distinction is clear. We're also going to be looking at things like file server, wireless LAN, and what a wireless access point is all about. Again, not too tricky to handle these. Just make sure that you have those in your exercise book somewhere. Now, these aren't just the only key terms. There are others that come across. So in this particular section, you're going to be coming across client server, dedicated servers and client workstations, which are connected to servers. We're going to be looking at spread spectrum technology, which basically means radio waves with a frequency of 30 to 50 meters. Think of this as Bluetooth, wireless, all of that kind of stuff. And then other terminology like nodes, which are individual workstations really, or clients connected in a client server uh, formation, or just about any network formation. We're going to be looking at peer-to-peer. -peer. We're going to be looking at thin and thick clients. So again, some basic definitions. Pause the video and have a look. All right, so why network in the first place? Think about this, when computers were all alone, chances are that you had to buy your own printer, none of that data that you had on your computer could be shared very easily with others. And even software, you know, used to be quite expensive. So the reason we network is that we can share these resources and that, that means we can reduce costs. So licenses to run software are often cheaper. Users can share files and data. You do that all the time. Access to reliable data that comes from a central source, such as a file server. Think about the school server, how you are provided with all sorts of services which are reliable. And these can be backed up as well at the end of each day, which is often very difficult if you have a standalone computer. Think about it. If everybody had a standalone computer, all their data had to be backed up individually. Well, with a central server, we can do it all together. And then you have access to things like email and instant messaging, which wouldn't be possible if computers were on their own. And finally, I think if you think about it, people like network managers and assistants can oversee the network and they can apply access rights to files and take care of security and backups and save the end user from a lot of these tasks which can be managed centrally. But there are also some drawbacks as well, because if you connect a lot of devices, you need a lot of cables and Often you have to buy servers and these can be quite expensive initially. Now managing a large network can often be a complex and difficult task. And this is why you need network managers, which is an additional expense. Devices can break down, such as file servers and hubs and switches, which can also affect the whole network. And then obviously things like malware and hacking can affect networks as well. Because the more points of access that you have into a network, the greater the risk in particular. However, you do get things like firewalls that can afford some protection in respect and then again you also have things like software which can support uh, in reducing the impact of malware but it's always a risk. Now networks can be of two types private or public and private networks are owned by generally a single company like the school for example and they often have LANs or intranets with restricted user access for example passwords and user IDs to join in. You can see this running all around school basically. The company or the organization is responsible for the purchase of their own equipment and software. They maintain the network and they hire and train staff as well. Then there are public networks which are owned by communications carrier companies such as you know your local telephone company or your ISP and many organizations will use this public network and there's normally no password specific protection or requirements whatsoever. However, to enter the network, there might be 
other networks in place or sub-networks which might have these access requirements. So think of these as layers. So you might have your sub-network which has password protection and security which then goes on to a public network which doesn't require any of those things and then connects to another sub-network which actually requires those things. So a lot of combinations are possible in a public network. So when to recommend what? Now if you've got a network that needs to be arranged over a hundred kilometers or over a thousand kilometers or even beyond you're probably going to be looking at a wide area network. If your network is between a kilometer and a hundred kilometers which is within a city or a metropolitan area range then obviously it's the MAN, the Metropolitan Area Network. If your network is between 10 meters to a thousand meters to a kilometer like on the same site, multiple buildings, that's a local area network and if your network is below that between a meter and 10 meters so that's a personal area network. So depending on the needs and the requirements you recommend each one. However to make these networks you need to have some kind of method or model to create these and the most common one is the client server model. Here you have a server which has lots of computers or clients that request services from them and these could be sending email, printing, finding or searching for information and they don't have to be physically present on the same side they can be over the internet as well so the client server model isn't just limited to one particular location. A system admin manages the whole network, makes sure that the clients are connected through the network and allows data access even if the distances are quite huge. Now some of the benefits are that you actually get dedicated servers and workstations and everything is connected together. Clients can access most of the data on these servers provided that you've given them access in the first place. The server controls the access to the files, it also controls the installation of files and programs on the clients. There's normally a security database which has usernames and passwords and you can also kind of set up access levels which, which provide you another in-depth level of security compared to peer-to-peer -peer networks. It's easy to scale up or down depending on your needs and it normally gives you a lot more stability especially how easy it is to back things up because you just need to back up the server. An example is Amazon. The company Amazon itself uses a client server network model. The user front end is updated every time a user logs on to the Amazon website and a large server architecture handles items such as products, order processing, billing, or, and even data security. Everything is on the back end. And none of the Amazon users are actually aware that there are other customers using the website at the same time. So you'd log on to Amazon, you just see what you want to do and there might be millions of other people around the world doing the same thing at the same time. There is no direct interaction between the users and the server since they are kept entirely separate at all times. So all you can think about is that when you go on to say something like Amazon, you are the client, you log on, you use their services and then you log off. Everything related to what you do is saved on the server and they back things up, they make sure that when you next log in your entire history is available to you. So the reasons to choose a client server model. When a company has a large user base, when you want to give access to network resources and you want to have them properly controlled then a client server model is probably best. When there's a need for good network security when the company requires its data to be free from accidental loss, in other words, you need to back it up, then a client server model would be recommended. However, it should be pointed out that this type of network model may still be used by small groups of people who are doing independent projects but have a need to share data and back data up. So it's not just always large companies, even smaller groups might want to use a client server model. So always look at the scenario that's given to you in the exam. Now we're going to move on to an extension of this which is thin and thick clients. So you've got a server and you want to access it. Normally you have two types of client. The first one is called a thin client which requires access to the server at all times. It can be a device or it can be a software program like a browser. It won't work unless connected at all times to a server on a LAN, MAN, WAN and so on. If you don't connect it to the server then it stops functioning. 
An example is a web browser, mobile phone apps, or a point of sale terminal at a supermarket all require access to a server. So if you disconnect that access, they stop working. You can't do much with them. The other type of client is a thick client, which could be your computer. And these can work both online or offline. And again, this can be a device or software. However, the difference between thin and thick is that a thick client can do processing whether it's connected to a server or not. And of course, it can be part of the LAN, WAN, MAN, virtual networks, internet, or a cloud system. Your tablet, your PC, laptop, software like computer games, word processors, and so on, these can both work offline and online. So these are examples of thick clients. Again, the distinction is one has to be connected to the internet or to the network at all times, and the other one can work both online and offline. Now on screen, you will see a comparison between thin and thick clients, especially on the pros and cons of it. So do pause the video and just have a look through these. Thick clients tend to be more robust. The device can carry out its own processing, but because it can keep its own data, it tends to be a lot less secure. Clients have a bit more control. They can store their own programs and data, but each client would need to update data and software individually. And then this can also lead to data integrity issues since clients access the same data, which can lead to inconsistencies because you've got data stored on different clients uh, all around, which probably doesn't update the central server immediately. Thin clients, on the other hand, are a lot cheaper. So they don't do a lot of processing, so we don't actually need expensive hardware for that. However, because of the high reliance on the server itself, if the server goes down, you can't do much uh, with a thin client. The other aspect is that all devices are linked to a server and that means that updates and new software installations are done centrally. The server can also offer protection against hacking and malware as well because you can have central firewalls. Otherwise, on thick clients, you might need to install them yourselves. Things can work out a lot more cheaper with uh, thin clients despite the initial setup costs, which can be expensive. So do make sure that you are aware of pros and cons and you can compare them easily. So here are some key points for comparison purposes. Thin clients always rely on a connection to a remote server. Thick client can run some of the features of the software even when it's not connected to a server. A thin client require few local resources such as SSD, RAM, memory or processing time, whereas a thick client relies heavily on local resources. Thin client requires a good, stable and fast network connection for it to work and thick client tends to be a bit more tolerant of a slow network connection. Data is stored on a remote server or a computer on a thin client, whereas a thick client can store data on local resources such as HDD or SSD. So these points of comparison are quite essential because you normally get a four mark question. Make sure that you are aware of them. However, a client server model tends to be a lot more restrictive. You are controlled by a server. You kind of like have a master-slave relationship. So people, once they were part of this type of network, wanted freedom. They wanted to kind of do a lot of things. They wanted to install their own software. They wanted to share their own data. And they didn't want the central server to know what they were up to because everything had to pass through that. And over time, it became quite restrictive. That freedom led to the development of the peer-to-peer -peer model. Now, peer-to-peer -peer models weren't uh, something that were new. They, they used to be set up earlier as well, but they weren't as popular. In a peer-to-peer -peer model, every computer is connected to every other computer on the network. So you just don't have one server. You just have multiple computers just connected with each other. And each of these computers are normally known as a node on the network. And there is no central node that controls everybody else. But sometimes you do need nodes uh, like trackers that know where everyone is on the network, uh, especially if you are using protocols like BitTorrent. However, in a peer-to-peer -peer model, every node is equal and every node shares the data that it particularly holds. No central server. Every node is equal. Every node shares its files. 
there is no authentication requirement as each node has its own data and it's just responsible for that. It does require a lookup computer that holds a list of nodes. Any node can be nominated to be one. You can also delegate the responsibility by rotating this uh, across the network. It's often very useful for small networks, up to 10 computers. Otherwise, you have performance issues because to connect to nodes which might be quite far away, you might need more cabling. You might need to ensure that uh, you use public networks as well, which means that you're going to be using some kind of server setup somewhere. And obviously, data security becomes weak because there is no one that's actually controlling the installation of security updates or firewalls and every node is responsible for its own security. Why would you want to choose a peer-to-peer -peer model? Well, if the number of network users is very small and there is no need for a robust security, then you would probably choose a peer-to-peer -peer model. Sometimes you require workstation-based applications rather than server-based applications. So you might say, well, okay, uh, I just need to hold everything on the computer that I'm working on and I don't actually need to share this with anyone else or, or use their services so I'm going to choose a peer-to-peer -peer model. And a simple example would be a business where there is frequent user interaction and there is no need to have features of a client server network. For example, a builder with uh, you know five workers located in their own homes who need access to each other's diaries, the jobs that they did, the skills that they know and so on. When the builder, for example, is commissioned to do a job, they just need to access each other's computer to organize the job and they don't necessarily need to share any other kind of data. So in that particular case, you'd probably want a peer-to-peer -peer network rather than a client-server based network. You should now be able to tell the differences between a thin and thick clients in a client-server model. You should also be able to list some benefits of the peer-to-peer -peer model and describe the difference between the peer-to-peer -peer model and the client-server model. You should be able to recommend what type of model to use depending on the scenario that you might be given. For example, a small organization with a few workers that want to share a few bits of information or a few different types of information or data might require a peer-to-peer -peer model. A bigger organization which wants to have user access, control security, access anywhere might require a client server model. That finishes the lesson for today. Next lesson we're going to be looking at topologies which are different methods of connecting devices in a network.